Aloha mai kako. This is Lili Kalaka Me'ilehiva, and this lecture is for Hawaiian Studies 270, lecture number eight. It's a temple overview of temples in Hawaii and Hawaii Nuiakea. And we're looking at Heiau and Marae as sacred spaces for learning ancient ancestral concepts. So this is the first in a five or six part series that I have on temples that all comprise lecture number eight. Here we go. Of course, before I begin such an important topic, I want to do a pule to the ancestors to ask them to come and be with us. And you can follow along with the uh, meaning in English. This is how it goes. I know my cook I know my cook Oh, li kuku puna wahine o hau mea kuku mumana o pele kuku aku ala e. O ku, o ku, ho o ni in u aku aka maina. O lono lono ma kua ho ai kia hi. O kane kane kawai o la me kana luai. E ma li o kuku aloe. E ho e ho i maia ma koka aina. Eho eho i maia ma ko ke ea, eho eho i maia ma ko ke eo puni, eho eho i maia ma ko ka mano ka lahu. E ma la mai ho ulu i ko ko mau pula pula, a ko lo pu pu, a ho maka i o, a i ko ko a pala lau halai, e pala i na mea i nua paue, a mama, ua noa, Today's lecture is about Akua. Now, in many places in Polynesia, we call Akua Atua. And these are divine elements, or gods, as some people call them. And we worship them, and we learn about them, and we pray to them in Heiau. In Hawaii, temples are called Heiau. But in most parts of Polynesia, Polynesia they're called Marai. Can everyone say Marai? Yeah. Now Heyo is two words. It's Hey and Au. And it's really He means to ensnare or to measure. And Au means time. It also means currents. So we're measuring time a lot of times with our Heyo, with our temples. We're also ensnaring the currents that are the Akua. The word marae, on the other hand, means a clear space. And marae refers to the clear spirit you must have when you go there to commune with the akua and to learn from the akua. Okay, so let's see what we find out about this. By the way, in all of my PowerPoints, if you see photographs of the canoe, those photographs are done by my son, Na'alehu Anthony, who has given me permission to use them. Mahalo. Okay, so here are some words I want you to learn. You've heard the word akua a lot in this class. It means a divinity of some sort. It also means an element. Yeah, maybe sometimes you haven't heard the word aumakua. Now, for Hawaiians, aumakua are ancestral gods. That is, when our ancestors die, when our parents die, they become akua. They become part of the spirits of the universe, the part of the elemental spirit and they live in that other world, the world of the spirits. Oftentimes they're with us in our world of the living. So that veil or division between the two worlds in the Hawaiian way of thinking is oftentimes kind of a thin one. Yeah. Now in Maori, in New Zealand, they say kaumatua. And aumakua and kaumatua are really the same word. Well, the first time I went to New Zealand, to Aotearoa, um, back in the 80s, I was asking some Maori people about a chant that I heard that was so very similar to a Hawaiian chant. I was just amazed. And they said they didn't know the answer to my question, but they would have to ask their kaumatua what they thought. So I thought they were going to pray to the unseen aumakua because I was translating Maori, which is very close to Hawaiian, into Hawaiian. So I thought kaumatua was the same as aumakua, but no. Kaumatua actually refers to kupuna, to their elders, who are very much alive and who teach them 
uh, all kinds of things about the ancestors. So that idea of ancestor, whether they're alive with us today or whether they've passed on, is part of that word, al-makua, al-kaumatua. Now, another word I'd like you to know is wailua, which is also pronounced wairua. Wailua, wairua. In Hawaiian, we often use the word uhane, and it refers to spirits, or it refers to the soul, it refers to that spark of life that we have within our living body. It's called uhane. Um, now, when you pass on and your, ba your body doesn't live anymore, what we have is lapu. Did everybody say lapu? We don't hear lapu too often these days. Although when I was a child, we heard it a lot. Now, lapu are ghosts. And um, these are spirits that haven't gone to the other world, but are kind of lingering in our world. And sometimes a lapu will come to visit you in your house. Maybe you're sitting in your living room and all of a sudden the door bangs open and you have no wind, but the door bangs open. That's because a lapu has entered your house, and so your living room, and you say to them, Aloha, and you say, Hello, my ai, please come and eat, because the spirit has come to visit you, you'd like to be hospitable, okay? So what kind of aumakua do we have? They're kaumatua or Maori or people, but for Hawaiian, aumakua are ancestral gods. For instance, when I was a child growing up, my mother always would say, don't forget I'm Pele. And, and it really struck me. She really believed that she was Pele. Now Pele, as many of you know, Tutu Pele is our fire goddess of the volcano. We'll learn a lot about her in this class, as a matter of fact. Um, my mother never talked to me about Pele so much, but if we went to the volcano, we would give offerings at the volcano. And that was our family guardian, and we knew that she would protect us. Um, Different people have different kinds of guardians. For some, it might be the sun, or the moon, or various stars. For some families, their aumakua is a rainbow. Some, especially fishermen, people who are in the sea a lot, it might be a shark, it might be a stingray, it might be a turtle, or different kinds of fish, or eels. Those who are associated with working with fresh water, oftentimes the aumakua is a mo'o, or a lizard. Those who are working in the forest might have aumakua that are hawks or owls or different kind of birds. Some who are planting taro might have an aumakua that's pig. Others may have dogs. So there's many different kinds of aumakua. We could also add rocks into this lit litany. Um, and you learn about it from your family. Basically, that's how you find out what your aumakua is. Okay, so let's talk about temples. We have different kinds of temples, different kinds of heiau. Luakini is one. Now these are all uh, temples that are listed in your reading from Kamakau. So this is where this slide comes from. Luakini is for human sacrifice. And I'm going to say the words of the temples and I'd like you to pronounce after me. So, can I hear Luakini? May I hear Hale o Papa? Could I hear Ho'oluai? May I hear Vaihau? Could I hear Ko'a? May I hear Pohaku Okane? May I hear Mua? Mahalo! So Aluakini is a place, a special kind of temple where human sacrifice was done. And there were lots of temples that did not have human sacrifice at all. So we're, the rest of all the ones that are listed here don't have human sacrifice. The next one, the Haleopapa, is a women's temple. Now, women did go to Luakini, and men did not go to Haleopapa. Hale, the house of Papa, refers to Papa, the Earth Mother, who is Haumea. This is the women's temple where we're going to find out they'll worship the Mo'orohini, or the lizard goddesses. So this is a place where females worship females, learn female knowledge. Another kind of temple is called Ho'oluai, and it's for the growth of crops. It's where you go to pray for the crops to grow properly and learn about what time of the year they grow best. Vaihau is another kind of temple, and uh, Kamakau says that Vaihau is for the fertility of land. And I most recently learned in the last couple of years that Vaihau is a temple for the Mo'o Vahine, separate from the Haleopapa, 
that is for the growth of uh, fresh water, vai meaning fresh water, and also for the um, calling of fish. So if you want fish in your fish ponds, you build a vaihau nearby and you pray to the mo'o vahine of the particular area that is going to call fish to your pond. Okay, another is ko'a. And this is a small altar that we're going to see in a little bit. Sometimes it's just a rock that is placed near the shoreline. And oftentimes you'll have white coral around it or white coral as part of the altar. The white coral represents the ko'a or the coral of the ocean, which is hina pukoa, hina of the coral. And the black rocks that you'll see in the ko'a will represent ku'ulakai, who is the god, the ku god of deep sea fishing. So we have both male and female in ko'a. Sometimes you have them made in the mountain near uh, medicinal plants, and you're going to have uh, both male and female pray to there for the medicinal plants as well. The next one we see in line is Puhaku or Kane, the rock of Kane, and it's usually a very phallic looking rock. Oftentimes people who worship Kane would have this kind of a rock in their yard or close to their home where they would do prayer and daily prayers and daily offerings to Kane. When there's any problem in the household, they would take that problem to Kane for a ceremony called Huikala, where all people in the family would be brought together to sit down and discuss what the problem is and find a resolution. Uh, this kind of ceremony today is called Ho'oponopono because it's a one done with Jehovah. But in the old days, if you're praying to Kane, it would be called Huikala. Uh, oftentimes a pig would be cooked. And when you're all finished talking about what the problem was, resolving the problem, then you eat the pig to remember the resolution of the conflict. And anything that wasn't finished of that pig you would bury in the ground in front of Puhako Kane as an offering to Kane as well. The last one on this list is the Mua, or the men's eating house. The Hale Mua is a place where men would worship the god Lono before they ate. There was a gourd hanging in a net in the corner of the house, and before they ate, they would put a little food into that gourd to, as a respect to Lono, who is the god of fertility of the land. So. These are different kinds of heia or temples. We're going to learn more about them. I'd first like to look at the ko'a for fishing and medicine. And here is a typical ko'a. This one is uh, called ku'ula, and it's at kahalu'u kona. If you look closely at the inside of the rock, you'll see a design that kind of looks like a shark. Oftentimes, ku'ula rocks will have fish or shark or stingray kinds of designs and they're not made by people just naturally occurring and this is where you would pray for your uh, fishing or if you um, were going out fishing and you caught some food you would come and make an offering here before you take the food home so that you always want to remember the akua of fishing hina pukua for inshore kuulakai for outside and that this kind of uh, fishing would be uh, supported by those two akua. Another kind of uh, heo is called pohaku okane. And this is what it looks like, the pohaku okane. It's a very phallic looking rock. You will notice that there's some coral bits around it too because oftentimes there's a male and female idea there. This is the rock that you would pray to when you want to resolve a problem within the family. It represents the god Kane. And this kind of phallic looking rock I've actually seen in multiples on temple platforms. Um, now, one by itself would be in your yard near your house for most people, but if you had a temple dedicated to the god Kane, then you might have several of these phallic stones on the platform of the temple. And I remember seeing one in Kalapana that's been taken over by Tutupele since, but that one had six Ohako Okane on a platform near a pool of water. It's quite interesting. Now, another kind of temple is Ho'ulu'ai, for the growth of crops. 
And the one we see here, Kuka o o heyao in Manoa, is a Ho'oluai. We know this by reading sites of Oahu, they tell us. This is the Ho'oluai. So this is a temple that you would go to pray for different kinds of crops. The word Kuka o o refers to a specific Ku god that's in charge of planting, and he lives in the o o digging stick that you use to plant your potato or bananas, or you might use to plant lo kalo, the lo'i kalo. Yeah, but um, this is a kind of an interesting one. So take a good look at this diagram. I want you to see that there is an arrow that is pointing north. If you take that north pointing arrow and put it on top of your temple design, you're going to see that this is a diagonal north temple. Okay. Where are we? Take a look at the number five and the number four. Number five and number four are parts of the temple that are facing towards the ocean, or Makai. Number eight and number nine are parts of the temple that are facing Mauka. Number five actually we, is showing us the entrance into this temple, so the entrance is from Makai. Number seven is the middle of the temple. And actually, right is, is right in the middle of that zero degrees north designation. So, if we're looking at this temple now in Manoa, number five is actually marking the southwest corner. Number nine, opposite number five, marks the northwest corner. Number four is the wall that'll take us to the southeast corner. And number eight will show us the northeast corner. Now, you're saying, wait a minute, Kumo, this is diagonal. Yes, it is. So actually, number nine across from number five is north. And the end of number four in that corner is actually south, with number eight pointing directly east. So let's have a look at this temple. In fact, you can go see the temple yourself. It's at the Manoa Heritage Center in the back of Manoa. Now here is a photograph of the entrance to the temple. This is the Ho'oluai Temple. This entrance takes you, that's the number five on your chart. Okay. And so that corner, and you can see it's facing the mountainside. That corner was number nine. That whole wall is number nine on your chart. So we're looking towards the mountain. Now we're looking towards the entrance towards the east. Actually, this is south, due south. And that's one end of that zero north designation. So here we're looking more towards the other corner, number eight. And number eight actually faces due east. So when it comes time for equinox, the sun should rise right over that corner. And in fact, on March 21, 2012, the folks who worked there at the Manoa Heritage Center got up very early in the morning to go and view the equinox, that's the rising of the sun, at due east, and there it was rising over the corner that faces the east. So Kuga O'o Temple, built for the growth of crops, would measure when the sun was rising at equinox, and then it would track the sun as it goes from March 21 to June 21 at summer solstice, it would track the sun coming back to equinox in September, which is the uh, fall equinox, and then would track the sun as it went south towards the winter equinox, and we'll find out more about that in this class. Here's another temple called Leleahina Heyao. It's in Heia O'ahu, and if you see the end, uh, that, that uh, end the, the marking north, and the drawing, the line with the arrow, you will see that this too is a zero degrees north temple. Just so happens, as we're looking at it, where the end is, that is facing towards the mountain. And then as you look at the bottom of this drawing, 
you'll see that there's kind of a, like a little peninsula that juts out and just above that is a platform that matches up with east when the sun rises at equinox which is Makuka O'o, very similar in design. This was called Ho'olu'ai as well so it's for the growth of uh, different kinds of food crops. Now please go to the next slideshow it's the end of this one and we're going to go on to the next portion which is Hawaiian Studies 270 lecture number 8 on temples beginning with slide number 22. Mahalo nui.